wanted to talk about has anybody heard of Alice Neal before? No. Well, um, she's now a very famous American artist, described as being using fearless brushstrokes and, and a renegade realism. I've, I'd never heard of her before, which is my usual reason for having a look at somebody uh, who seems to be famous, and yet I've never heard of them. She was born in, in uh, on the 28th of January, 1900. Now, it's a really good year to be born in because it's really easy to calculate somebody's age when they grow up, the, when they're born <laughs> in the beginning of the century. She was very much into to doing uh, paintings of outcasts and marginalized people such as transvestite and um i i just think some of her some of her paintings are really really good and for, for most of her life she was unknown and um was living on benefits with numerous children by different fathers and anyway this painting this one that's in the background which is of uh, jackie curtis and Rita Red in 1970 during when she lived in Spanish Harlem in New York, sold in 2009 for 165 million dollars. Which it's horrible. I had, I had to keep looking at that figure again. I couldn't believe it. 165 million dollars for one painting by somebody until the 1960s had been ignored. <laughs> um, and interestingly. Her art features in a um, program of Freakonomics. You remember the series on Freakonomics, which looked at the art market. She came from a family that um, wasn't at all artistic, and she, but she was very keen on painting right from an early age. Her, her mother said to her, I don't know what you expect to do in the world. You're only a girl. And she always wanted to be an artist from a very early age. This is of her portrait of her husband, Cuban artist Carlos Enriquez. They married in 1925 in Colwyn, as in Colwyn Bay, Pennsylvania. So she was at the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, moved to Havana in 1927 with her first husband, the Cuban painter. Carlos Enrique. When he opened a nightclub in Madrid, Carreño came over and did the murals. They were great patrons of their Cuban contemporary artists. The Vanguardia movement was a breakaway artistic movement in Cuba that advocated modernism, a nationalism, which is seen mostly in the coloration and in the themes used by the members. The two Cuban paintings that we're showing, they belong to the collection of Eduardo and Dori Gonzalez. This amazing portrait is of Maria Luisa Gomez Mena, who was a Cuban philanthropist. She's sometimes referred to as the Cuban Peggy Guggenheim. She married Mario Carreño, who did this portrait of her. She established a publishing house for avant-garde poetry, and she started the first modern art gallery in Havana called Galeria del Prado. The other painting from the Gonzalez collection is The Three Musicians by Kundo Bermudez, who was a younger member of the Vanguardia movement. Kundo was very, very fascinated with music and musicians and the theater, and they were a theme throughout his life. What is extraordinary about these paintings is their provenance. Both the Kundo Bermudez and the Carreño have been off the market since they were acquired in the early 40s. I've never heard of that movement. I don't know whether anybody else had, but she, she went over and lived there and was quite influenced by them and did some painting there. And But eventually her marriage with uh, Carlos Enriquez folded. It's a movement called, again? It's called the Cuban Vanguardia movement. Oh, right, okay. Vanguardia. They, they can see it there. Obviously, it was before the the uh, the takeover of Cuba from a rather corrupt Baptista regime, but she she was there for it anyway. And there there are some of the paintings. I I thought I think they're really interesting, really nice. So uh, uh, it's it's something that might be worthwhile looking at it in its own own sense. This is one of the paintings that she did in this period of mother and child in 1926, I think it was. She began exhibiting in the 1920s uh, after returning to the United States, a series of fundings available for artists and others. And she, she got funded by that. But she, when she returned back to um, America, just before her baby's first birthday 
it died, the daughter died of diphtheria. And the trauma caused by that infused her paintings at the time with a precedent for her, the themes that she had, which were motherhood, loss, and anxiety. The nurse looks like she's wearing an Aztec headdress. If she does, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah. In the spring of 1930, Carlos uh, gave the impression he was going overseas to look for a place to live in Paris. Instead, he returned to Cuba, taking the other, the later daughter, Isabella, with him. So she was out without that child as well. Mourning for the loss of her husband and daughter, understandably, Neil had a nervous breakdown, was hospitalised and attempted suicide. She was placed in the suicide ward of the Philadelphia General Hospital. And even there, she painted. Uh, this is her daughter speaking. Alison loved a wretch. She loved the wretch in the hero and the hero in the wretch. She saw that in all of us, I think. She, she was engaged in what was called Federal Project Number no. 1, a federal art project. It's employed about several thousand artists to do various things. And this one, it was of Alice and Neil and John Rothschild, who were, I think, having an affair at the time, both having a pee. <laughs> one in the toilet, one in the sink. According to the Secretary of Commerce at the time, Harry Hopkins, they, they, the Federal Project Number no. 1 employed up to 40,000 writers, musicians, artists and actors because the Secretary of Commerce put it, hell, they've got to eat too. So I think she got something like $30 a month from the commission, which kept her going because she was um, she was really very poor at the time. She painted in a realist style and the subjects are mostly depression era street scenes and communist thinkers and leaders. She then moved on to Spanish Harlem. This is one sunset in Spanish, Spanish Harlem for 1958. It's, an, it's a part of New York, Spanish Harlem, part of the, I suppose, wider Harlem. And she began pa pa painting her neighbours, women and children. So that's two girls in Spanish Harlem, rather sweet. Dominican Boys on 108th Street, 1955. I really like that one for some reason. I think their faces are great. Mm -hmm. Now this is Al Sam and Alice, or Alice and Sam. Her second son, Hartley, who was um, born in 1941, it was by her lover, the communist intellectual, Sam Brody, who you can see with her there. During that period, she um, did illustrations for the communist publication Masses and Mainstream and continued painting portra portraits. However, in 1943, the Works Progress admin ceased working with Neil, which made it harder for her to support her two sons. During this time, Neil would shoplift and was on welfare to help make ends meet. So she, she didn't have it easy, but I mean, you could say some of it was all of her own making, but even so, she had a very torrid sort of life. This is from the um, New York Museum of Art, and it's of an exhibition they had in 2020 or 2021 of the various paintings that they put up of. And this is of a later period, and it's Jeffrey Hendricks and Brian, which I think is a great painting, actually. And there's another one, Cindy Nesma and Chuck in 1975. For Neil, the occasion of painting a nude was more an opportunity to make an unclothed portrait for instead of reducing the female form to a mere object of flesh, she endowed it with personality, wit and humanity. Particularized with the sitter's facial features and restored their dignity as human beings rather than treating them as sexual objects. She, in the 1970s, she wanted to do, she was commissioned by the actually Time magazine to do a portrait of Kate Millett. Do everybody, anybody remember Kate Millett? No. Yeah. Beginning of yeah. the women's lib movement. Um, so this, she only used a photograph because Millet was used by the feminist her. art movement, who kind of partly adopted her because of, because of the feminist nature of a lot of the portraits that she did. Um, Neil considered herself a collector of souls, and she aimed to capture Millet's powerful aura in this. This is a self-portrait of her in 1980. How old was she then? 80. Mm. Correct. She died actually four years later, so it was one of the last paintings. <laughs> but I, I think it's great. I really like that one. I think it's really good. She, she's sitting, sitting on a chair in her studio, fully nude. She wore her glasses for it, held her paintbrush on her right hand and an old cloth on the other hand. The white colour of her hair and several creases and folds of her bare skin indicate her old age. In one of the last paintings, she challenged the social norms of what was acceptable to be depicted in our art. Now, this is a more typical of ones, which was of uh, 
one of her friends, Margaret Evans, who, who was very reluctant to sit for her, of her pregnant. This is 1978. Neil herself was a mother of four. First daughter died, as we mentioned, on the, before her first birthday. Uh, a year later, she gave birth to Isabetta, who at 18 months was taken from her and raised both her husband's family in Cuba. They would only ever meet a handful of times. Almost a de decade later, she miscarried and went on to have two boys, Richard in 1939, Hartley in 1940, with different fathers. She raised her sons as a single mother. But it, I do think she's a very interesting painter and worthwhile having a look at some of the paintings that came into that montage that I gave earlier on. If you just, I like her the faces. They look like people that you would just meet in the street, don't they? They just look like, you know, they, they're quite they're quite expressive the way that she does those faces. Yeah, that she normalizes the nude, and it's fantastic that it's not sexualized in terms of um, the, you know, the 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 oh gosh, what sensationalism or whatever. For me, she just misses uh capturing that sort of intense emotionality that response i can get from an amazing work of art where i just go wow and i can't stop staring at it and i find it reminiscent of uh diego rivera and frida carlo all part of that uh sort of latin american style yeah i thought i mean i think she was very much influenced by her cuban trip by stay, living there for a while, and also by living in Spanish Harlem. I think there's a great uh, correlation with the music of these places as well, you know, that, that we're not familiar with. You know, Villa Lobos and, uh, and Joachim and uh, all, all of that, that Spanish 